Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 151, Dr. Michael Rota on Pascal's Wager. Dr. Michael Rota earned a Ph.D. in philosophy from St. Louis University. Since then, he's been a professor of philosophy at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. The author of many scholarly book chapters and professional journal articles, he's published in prestigious venues such as the journals Faith and Philosophy, The Monist, Religious Studies, The American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, and The History of Philosophy Quarterly. He's here today to discuss his new book called Taking Pascal's Wager, Faith, Evidence, and the Abundant Life. Dr. Rota, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Thanks, Dale. Dr. Rota, congratulations on your new book. It's beautifully written and makes use of a lot of good work that's been done recently by Christian philosophers. How did you come up with the idea of combining a version of Pascal's Wager with a consideration of evidences for God and for Christianity? Well, to be honest, I can't remember exactly, but probably I got it from Pascal himself. Blaise Pascal was a 17th century scholar in, in France. He's famous as a physicist and mathematician, but he was also a deeply religious man and contributed to the theological debates of his time. Uh, in his mid-30s, he started writing a uh, work of Christian apologetics, a, a book but then he got sick and he died before he finished it. He died when he was only 39. So his friends and family found all these notes, very jumbled up. But they edited them, arranged them, and published them as Pascal's Pensée, which means thoughts in French. And if you read the Pensée, you'll see that it contains both Pascal's wager, an argument we'll talk about, and then also plenty of evidence and arguments for the truth of Christianity Pascal himself focused on prophecies and miracles, mainly prophecies. The bottom line is that the book Pascal intended to write would have combined Pascal's wager and then arguments for the truth of Christianity. He just never finished it. Philosophers kind of prefer to discuss Pascal's wager in isolation from consideration of evidence, but that wasn't his intention. No. The wager occurs in one small fragment of Pascal's writing, there's a lot more in the Ponce on evidence for Christianity. There's large sections on fulfilled prophecies, for example. Dr. Rhoda, was the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis an inspiration for this? It sure was. I first came across Mere Christianity in high school, read it, realized I wasn't understanding it at all. But the parts that I understood I found very interesting, and uh, I learned a lot from the book. I read it again in college, understood more. And I've recommended it to many people since then. Occasionally, I'll have students come into my office who are interested in Christianity, but aren't sure whether it's true and want to know what sort of rational case can be made for Christian theism. And one book that I'll recommend is Mere Christianity. But it's not quite enough, in my view, because in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, he only gives one argument for the existence of God. It's the moral argument. And while I think the moral argument is worthy of consideration, it's by no means the strongest argument for the existence of God. I myself think the cosmological and fine-tuning arguments are stronger. Certainly when you add them all together along with the moral argument, you have a stronger case. So in the book I wrote, I wanted to include additional arguments for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity that Lewis doesn't address. I have to say, Dr. Rhoda, if somebody asked me if they should read Mere Christianity, I would, I would recommend this book over that. Yeah, well, I, uh, thank you. I realized you were doing a similar thing, and I think you more successfully than he does stay away from controversial claims. There's so many places in that book where he's giving his own kind of speculations, and as you said, the moral argument is something a lot of us aren't really hot on. Mm. Your book is just plain better argued. And uh, I noticed in the introduction that you thank a huge roster of Christian philosophers. <laughs> and that many people looking over an argument results in a better argument than one literature professor, even if he's a guy from Oxford and a very smart guy. <laughs> so 
I really like the book and I think it's more successfully doing the kind of thing that he was trying to do. Thank you, Dale. Uh, you know, I did have a lot of help. I had the good fortune to be involved in a series of summer seminars in philosophy of religion, which we held at my university. So we had terrific speakers, Al Planiga, Peter Van Inwagen, Elliot Sober, Evan Fales, theists and atheists and agnostics come and exchange views. And so I had all that to draw on and uh, as well as many colleagues reading drafts and such. Yeah, and I think in the first part of the book, you show that the wager is really something to be reckoned with. So let's talk about that. How would you explain Pascal's wager? The most basic presentation is this. You should commit to living a Christian life because there is so much to gain and comparatively little to lose. So it's important to understand who the argument is addressed to. It's addressed to a religious skeptic, an unbeliever, who doesn't believe in God, but who thinks God might exist. And more exactly, who thinks that Christianity might be true. What makes the argument distinctive is that it's pragmatic rather than theoretical. Most arguments for the existence of God conclude with the sentence, therefore God exists. But Pascal's wager, the conclusion is not God exists. The conclusion is you should do such and such. So he says, you should live a religious way of life. He says you should act as if you believe in God. That can be taken in two ways. One, you could think that means you should go around saying you believe in God when you don't. Well, mm -hmm. that's immoral, and I don't think that's what Pascal was recommending. Mm -hmm. the, the other interpretation is that you should live a religious life. You should go to church. You should read scripture. You should pray. You should talk to religious believers about their religious life and experience. say a few more things. So first I want to go a little more into depth about how the argument works and then I want to say a few things about Pascal's theory of conversion and how he thought the wager would fit in his overall apologetic project. So a little more depth to the argument. Think of it like this. Either Christianity is true or not. And to make things simple to start, let's just consider two options. Either Christianity is true or there's no such being as God, all the religions are false, when you die, it all goes black. Mm -hmm. So these are two options that are plausible to many people in our society. And let's consider each possibility in turn. Suppose you commit to God, to living a Christian way of life, and it turns out Christianity is true. Well, then you've come out way ahead compared to how things would have gone if you hadn't committed right. to God. Eternal life is a pretty big deal. It's a big deal. And not just eternal life for you, you would have brought joy to God rather than turning your back on him. You would have showed gratitude to God and you would have been more helpful to other people in the most important way possible. That is, you would have helped or been more likely to help other people in their journey towards God and eternal happiness. So if Christianity is true and you commit to God, the outcome for you and others is very valuable. If on the other hand, if Christianity is true and you don't commit, you have a lower chance of eternal salvation, you might still make it, but the chance is going to be lower. You've probably been less likely to help other people in their journey to God. You've turned your back on God. These are large, large negatives. But next, what if Christianity is false? What if you die and it all goes black? Well, if you've committed to God, you've lost perhaps certain illicit pleasures. You've perhaps wasted time in church and prayer, or at least spent time in church and prayer. Maybe your social relationships were strained at certain points. This can happen. Sometimes living a rel religious life puts us in conflict with others who don't have our views. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to, but it can. Mm -hmm. So there might be negatives. On the other hand, there are huge positives. If you've committed to living a Christian life, even if you're wrong, it turns out there are large positives. 
in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of social science research on the this worldly benefits of religious commitment. Turns out, at least this is true in societies with religious freedom, societies like the United States, the following things are true. Committed religious believers tend to live longer than non-believers, non-religiously active individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, even when you control for other variables like marital state, race, income level, you control for all those variables. Actively religious live longer. They also report higher degrees of satisfaction with their life. Robert Putnam of Harvard and his colleague Chayun Lim of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, they've done a study where they were examining the correlation between religiosity, how actively one participates in a religion, and self-reported happiness or satisfaction with one's life as a whole. Let me just read some of the things they say. Scholars who study the connection between religion and subjective well-being appear to agree on a few points. First, most studies find a positive association between religious involvement and individuals' well-being. Second, studies find that the association between religion and subjective well-being is substantial. And they go on to say, uh, cite a study that estimates that the gross effects of religious involvement account for 2 to 6% of the variation in subjective well-being. When compared with other correlates of well-being, religion is less potent than health and loneliness, but it is just as or more potent than education, marital status, social activity, age, gender, and race. Other studies find that religious involvement has an effect comparable to or stronger than income. So then Lim and Putnam went on to do their own analysis of their own data. Here's one thing they find. In an average case, controlling for other variables, quote, 28.2% of people who attend a service weekly are predicted to be extremely satisfied with their lives, compared with only 19.6% of those who never attend services. This result is roughly comparable to the difference between someone in good health and another in very good health, or the difference between someone with family income of 10,000 and another with 100,000. So, Suppose you commit to Christianity and it turns out it was false. You never find that out, of course. You're likely to have had a more a sunnier life, a slightly more happy life, a slightly longer life. And you've also been trying to live a, a morally excellent life. You've had a life which you take to be meaningful. So these are positives. All things considered then, for most people, I argue in the book that you won't lose much if you've committed to Christianity and you were wrong. Of course, you'll have had a false belief. That's not good. But on the other side, if you fail to commit to Christianity and it turns out it's true, you will have missed out on the most important true belief. You risk error either way, but one of the two choices seems to promise more value for you and others. How is this all to fit within Pascal's larger apologetic program? Well, Pascal noticed that what people believe in many important matters is very often influenced not just by evidence and reason, but by our desires, our emotions, what we want to be true. He also thought that while there is good evidence that Christianity is true, he thought no fallen human being would find that evidence convincing without the help of God's grace. So he developed a rhetorical strategy that took into account these two observations. One, he wanted to try to make his readers want Christianity to be true. If they're not at least open to it, if they want it to be false, no matter how much evidence you give them, they're not going to be convinced. So he wanted to make his readers desire to see the beauty of Christianity and desire that it's true and to see the good that it promises and desire that good. Secondly, he wanted to try to convince his readers to live a certain way, to live a godly moral life, the theory being, if they do that, they'll put up fewer obstacles to God's grace. With obstacles removed, they're more likely to receive God's grace, and then they can see the evidence for what it is, good evidence for the truth of Christianity. They'll be able to appreciate the strength of the evidence. So that's Pascal's wager. A lot of interesting stuff there and a lot of evidence that Pascal never dreamed of, I'm sure, from the social sciences. It's not just a few studies, it's many dozens of studies and meta-studies of the studies. And <laughs> the evidence you lay out in the book is pretty impressive. 
So the argument is addressed to somebody who is at least open-minded about Christianity and who's looking at their Christian neighbors and saying, well, those people seem like they're doing pretty well, and they don't think that being a Christian involves anything just obviously morally horrible. It involves good things. I'm not sure everybody in our society will agree with those things. (laughs) I also have met people who don't want it to be true, I think that's got to be irrational if you really think about it. Mm. I mean, suppose I'm an atheist. Surely I should still want there to be a perfect being who's going to give Hitler what he deserves and reward somebody, you know, who's killed unjustly. I mean, don't I want a just universe? Yeah. And am I going to even grant that there could be another way that the universe could be just, if not God? So it seems to me if I'm an atheist, I should be sad about this. And I should want it to be true. And then if I don't think there is a devastating case against belief in God, I should be at least open to it. Occasionally you'll find a statement from an atheist philosopher who will say something like, uh, somebody will ask him, uh, maybe you know the source of this quote I'm referring to, actually, feel free to chime in. There was one philosopher, someone asked him what he would do if if he uh, died and then woke up and found himself in the presence of God. And he said he would kill himself. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or shake his fist at God and say, why didn't you give me more evidence? <laughs> or something like that. There is a story about Bertrand Russell, which is the second, which involves the second of those two claims. Someone asked Russell, what will you do if you die and find out God exists? And Russell said, he would say to God, not enough evidence, God. You did not give enough evidence. Well, that takes some chutzpah, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 how does he know how much would be was the best, you know? <laughs> But anyway, so that's the intended audience, people who are not thoroughly convinced, but who are noticing that Christians seem to be leading pretty good lives. Let me say a few things about audience. So scholars who study Pascal tend to say that the audience of his planned apologetics book were religious skeptics of his time. He lived in a skeptical age, the age of Montaigne. However, it may be that Pascal also had in mind fallen away Catholics lapsed Catholics, he himself was Catholic, lapsed Christians. So people who perhaps still might have believed in God, but weren't living an active religious life. I think the wager is helpful for both such groups. On the one hand, if a person thinks there's a decent chance Christianity is true, but isn't a believer, the wager can be a helpful incentive to to search and to search in part by immersing oneself in a religious community and a religious life. But also for the person who is already in some way or another connected to a Christian way of life, the wager gives us a reason to commit fully, to go deeper. In the book, I argue, provided we think there's at least a 50% chance or higher that Christianity is true, we've got excellent reason to commit fully because the upside is so important and the downside is so small. So Pascal's wager can helpfully be addressed, I think, to believers. We almost all have moments of doubt. I myself find the existence of God fairly intuitive. God just seems present to me much of the time. But sometimes that feeling departs or that intuition vanishes. And it's, it's definitely a different state to be in, and I notice it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes in those times, I think, gee, you know, I wonder if it's all false. It's possible that Christianity is false. And then I often think, but it's also possible that it's true. And I don't want to risk turning my back on God. Uh, for what? You know, for what, what good things would, would I have instead if I left Christianity? So for me, although I have belief, I still find the wager helpful here and there. Dr. Rhoda, it occurs to many people to object that the wager is somehow selfish or cynical and that it conflicts with Christian ethics. I guess their idea is that God would not approve of a mere religious gambler. Do you think charges like that can be made to stick? There are different versions of the wager that have been given, and it's certainly possible to give a a selfish version 
or to take the wager for selfish reasons. Here's a quotation from James Franklin, who's a mathematician who's written on Pascal's wager. He contrasts two versions. He says, here's what Pascal actually said, quote, you have to choose whether to accept religion. Think of it as a coin toss where you don't know the outcome. In this case, if you lose, there's no God, you have not lost much. But if you win, there's an infinite payoff. So you should go to mass and pray for faith. Here's Pascal caricatured. Being base and greedy, we want lots of goodies in this life and if possible, the next. So we are prepared to give up some pleasures now on the off chance of a lot more later if our eye to the main chance makes it look worth our while. Since the loot on offer is infinite, even a small chance of raking it in makes it worth a try to grovel to any deity that might do what we want. Okay, that version of the wager is selfish and is not to be recommended. But that wasn't Pascal's thought. That's the wrong way to think about the wager. In the version that I prefer, there are many goods motivating the wagerer that go beyond the, the wagerer's own self-interest. So it's not just about me. I don't want to let God down, and I also want to be helpful to other people. It's not just about me, and I also noticed that when you presented it, you don't focus only on pleasure. I mean, there are philosophers who think that the only intrinsic good is pleasure, and the only intrinsically bad thing is pain. But that's an extreme view, and you're not committed to that when you give the wager. Right. You might even think you have a moral duty to commit to following God, provided that you think there's a good chance it's true. So if Christianity is true, we do have a moral duty to love God and live the way he suggests. <laughs> so let's say you think there's a 50% chance that Christianity is true. You're in a situation a little like this. Imagine you're walking down the street and you look over to someone's house that they have a pool and you see what appears to be a child floating in the pool face down. You're worried that the child is drowning or is well on its way to drowning. You rush over, there's a gate, it's locked. You realize to get in and save what might be a drowning child, you'll have to trespass, break the law. You have to break the lock. You have to ruin someone's property. But of course, you have a moral duty to go look, even if you're not sure the child's drowning. I mean, even if you think there's a decent chance, you've got a duty to check this out because of the goods at stake. And something similar might be true of Christianity. So moral concern can motivate the wager. That's actually a point that Peter Kreeft makes in some of his work on the wager. Well, yeah, we are a tremendous influence on one another, so this could affect my family and friends, especially my family, I would think. Right, your children. How do you raise your children? You have to make a decision. Will I raise them living a religious life, or will I let them choose when they're 18, for example? There's more to say about the selfishness objection, though. Suppose I were just motivated by the desire for eternal life. I'm not thinking about anybody else. We got to ask whether this is wrong. I mean... It's wrong not to think about anything else. But let's say at the moment I'm taking the wager, I'm motivated primarily by my own eternal welfare. Mm -hmm. It's not wrong to want to be happy. And the means by which you're attempting to achieve this, going to church, praying, searching for God, these aren't intrinsically wrong. So it doesn't look wrong to want to desire eternal life and to search out God as a consequence. Indeed, if Christianity is true, God is okay with this. We have the parable of the prodigal son. So the son leaves the, his father, takes inherit, his inheritance early, burns through it. We know the story. In the end, he decides to come back to his father. And why? According to the text, it says, basically, he realized he was hungry and he, he wouldn't have to be hungry. He could be doing a lot better if he went back to his father. So it appears that the prodigal son has a selfish motivation. It's certainly not a lily white motivation but the father welcomes him with open arms. A last thing to say about the selfishness objection is this, remember who we're talking to. We're talking to a person who has a decision to make. Will they commit to living a Christian way of life or not? Now, maybe their motivation is less than praiseworthy if they commit to living a Christian life just for their own sake, for their own future happiness. But where do we want them to end up? with a real faith and with the right sort of love for God. I have to ask, how am I more likely to end up with that right sort of love for God? If I try to commit to living a Christian life, even out of mixed motives, or if I don't try at all? 
So the wager can be a first step on the journey to a more mature and praiseworthy relationship with God. So one point is these kind of motives are not mutually exclusive. You might do something motivated by self-interest, that's, that is whatever is good for you, but also be motivated by what's good for others or motivated by purely moral considerations. Right. I think a lot of people confuse acting in your self-interest with acting selfishly. Hmm. I mean, we expect everybody to constantly act in their self-interest, right? That's why you brush your teeth, because <laughs> you don't want to get cavities. That would be bad for you. That's the main reason you brush your teeth, right? Right. Selfishness seems more apt when we have a situation where, where you're preferring yourself to others in some way, yeah. where you're getting more and they're getting less. You're not giving them due regard. Yeah. But that doesn't apply in the case of the wager. Your commitment to God doesn't take away from other people's happiness, or it shouldn't. Yeah, I was going to say the only people who don't consider their self-interest are crazy or they have a death wish, like they're suicidal. Hmm. I mean, we're always considering our self-interest. We have to. Yeah. It's called just uh, walking with your eyes open, basically. I believe Aquinas talks about the duty of self-love. I'm not sure, but certainly... It follows from something Jesus says. So he says, love others as yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, that command has no content if you don't love yourself at all. Mm -hmm. So we have a duty to love God and to love others, but also to love ourselves. Dr. Rota, what is the famous many gods objection, which a lot of philosophers think is fatal to Pascal's wager? The simplest version goes like this. There are many religions that might be true. And so there are many different ways of committing to God that might lead to an infinitely valuable outcome. The sorts of considerations that come up in Pascal's wager then can't tell you which religion to commit to. They can't tell you to commit to Christianity rather than Judaism or Hinduism or Islam. So the objection is Pascal's wager doesn't help you know what to do. That's the simplest version of the objection. There are other more complicated versions. This is often considered a strong argument against Pascal's wager, but you can frame the wager in such a way that the objection can be answered fairly easily. And to see this, it's helpful to realize Pascal's wager is not a single argument. There's really a family of related arguments. Pascal himself gives four different arguments in this little fragment from the Pensee. It's only about 1,600 words long. And there's so much in there, including four different versions of a pragmatic argument for religious commitment. The third of the four arguments that Pascal gives has come to be known as the canonical wager. It's Pascal's wager, the single argument. It's what philosophers have focused on the most. And it's very ambitious. It says, as long as you're willing to admit that Christianity has any non-zero finite probability, then you should commit to living your Christian life. Mm -hmm. Even if you only think it's 0.00001%. That's an ambitious argument, and it's been beat up by philosophers. For one thing, it can very easily fall prey to the many gods objection. Because there are many, for a person who thinks Christianity is just barely possible, they're also probably going to think many other religions are just barely possible. And so they're not gonna, Pascal's wager is gonna help them decide which religion to commit to. However, there's another strand also in Pascal, which says the evidence is at least as good for Christianity as is the evidence for the falsity of Christianity. So in that situation where you think it's at least 50-50 here, then you should wager for Christianity. That's the version of the wager I like better. The version of the wager I prefer only addresses a person who already thinks Christianity is at least as likely as not. For evidential reasons, they already think that. Maybe they think it's almost certainly true. Maybe they think it's probably true. Maybe they think it's dead even. Also, the person I'm addressing in the book is someone who thinks that Christianity is more probable than other religions. So if you think Christianity is probably true and you're willing to grant that Judaism might be true, but you think it's a much less likely proposition, Uh, Then the version of the wager I give will apply to you. Many God's objection won't have force because the many God's objection says, how do you know which religion to to follow? And I say, you follow the religion you think is most likely to be true. And you figure that out by looking at the evidence. 
Is it fair to say the gist of the response is to the many gods objection? I never said I was going to tell you which religion was true based purely on wagering considerations. Absolutely. That's exactly right. From the fact that the decision, theoretic, pragmatic argument of Pascal's wager, from the fact that that stuff doesn't tell you which religion is true, it doesn't follow that there's no way to figure out which religion is true. Yeah, this is an interesting topic. I mean, people assume it's impossible to narrow the options, but well, they'll say things like that, but then clearly they don't consider some things to be plausible options like others. I mean, if you've looked much into Scientology, mm. for instance, it doesn't seem that hard to mark it off. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't seem exactly on a level with Judaism, Christianity, Islam, etc., Sikhism, Hinduism. Mm. I mean, a religion made up by a guy who once bragged that the way to make some money in today's world is to make up a religion. <laughs> right. I mean, what does it take to rule one out? <laughs> if it's, never mind even the content of the teachings, which seems like it should be important too. But yeah, I think that's a powerful point that uh, you don't have to just only go by wagering considerations. And surely there is relevant evidence there because we all know that you can rule some things out. Well, maybe you can rule a lot of things out. Right. And rule some things in. I see the wager as complementing the work of natural theology and the investigation of the various religions. So before you think about the wager, you might suppose that committing firmly to a religion requires that you first figure out that it's almost certainly true. And I think the sorts of considerations that Pascal raises show that that's false. You don't need to be absolutely certain before you dive in with both feet. Mm -hmm. So what Pascal's wager does is it lowers the bar of evidence that's required to make religious commitment rational. It lowers it a lot, all the way down to 50%, I argue in the book. Richard Swinburne has a certain view of belief, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, where he says, if you think a proposition is 50% or more likely to be true, then you believe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he argues for belief in God. And the threshold he has to meet on his own theory is only 50%. Well, I have to say that part of Swinburne isn't convincing to me. There are many propositions I think they're likely, but I don't believe them. For example, let's say I have a die, a single six-sided die. I'm about to roll it. Do I believe it won't be a five or a six? No. It might be a five or a six. I don't believe it won't be a five or a six. Now, I think it's 66.7% likely that it won't be a five or six, but I don't actually go ahead and, and form a belief that, oh, it's not going to be a five or six. Hmm. So even if Swinburne is wrong about the threshold for belief, if you have the wager on your side, you get the same conclusion about the threshold of evidence needed for commitment, religious commitment. It's not that we have to commit to believing whatever rises to the level of 50% epistemic probability in our eyes. That's not what you're saying. Right. You're saying there are a lot of things that are 50% and even more probable that we don't believe. But we still might have practical grounds to act in a certain way because of them. Right. Like the, is that a drowning kid or right. is it a toy in the water? Right. And so the target action that Pascal's wager is focused on isn't, Pascal isn't telling you, form a belief at will. He's telling you to live a certain way. And that can be rational even without convincing evidence that Christianity is true. I think there is convincing evidence that Christianity is true. But for the person who doesn't think that, so long as they think it's at least as likely as not, then the, the purpose of Pascal's wager is to try to show that person it's practically rational for them to jump in with both feet and live a Christian life. Dr. Rhoda, some of the quotes you gave in your book made it clear that some people are really offended by Pascal's wager precisely because they think it's being suggested that a person should just believe based on practical considerations. But no, if the recommendation is to live a religious life, then presumably you might come to believe 
that again, I think offends people. They're saying, well, you're just trying to trick yourself into believing through social pressure. But what I hear you saying is that there is social pressure, sure, positive and negative, but how do we know there isn't going to be more evidence that we encounter in that group as well? Right. A few thoughts on this point, too. Here's a, a, a moral objection to Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager says, commit to living a Christian life. And the goal that's motivating you is that you want to end up in a close relationship with God. But presumably, belief in God will be a means to achieving that close relationship. It's hard to be close to someone if you're not even sure they exist. Mm -hmm. So the worry is that the person who takes Pascal's wager is gonna have a desire to come to faith, to come to believe. And the, the worry is that that desire may lead them to acquire a belief by non-rational means, to self-deceive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so self-deception is wrong and not a good idea. So does Pascal's wager have to involve self-deception? I want to argue that it doesn't. Here's Pascal's theory. What's holding the unbeliever back from committing to Christianity is not about evidence. It's largely about their passions, their emotions, their desires. That's the problem. We're fallen human beings. And if we can live a better life and moderate our passions and with God's help live a more moral life, then we're more likely to eventually come to a place where we can see the evidence for God. So, if that's right, then what the wager is doing is removing non-rational obstacles to belief and putting him or herself in a position where he or she is more able to see the evidence that's there. Okay, there's nothing epistemically blameworthy about that. Now the objector might say, well, if Pascal's right about his theory of conversion, that's all true, but Pascal might be wrong. And it might be that the if I commit to Christianity, just because of social pressure and self-deception, I'm going to be ensnared in an illusion. So I agree, that's a danger. If you start out thinking Christianity might be false, you should think that's a danger. You might come to have a false belief. Mm -hmm. But we often take on, we take risks when there's good reason to. So we have to ask, is the risk of getting ensnared in a deception so large that it's a reason not to commit? Or is, is it an acceptable risk? And there are two considerations which suggest it's, it is an acceptable risk here. First of all, when you commit to living a Christian life, you shouldn't blind yourself to counter evidence. We should love what's true and care about having true beliefs. So the Christian should not become an automaton who believes whatever the pastor says or whatever interpretation of the Bible occurs to him. We need to hold on to our rationality and Search, search for God, love God with our minds, right? Continue using our minds. So that reduces the risk of, of becoming ensnared in an illusion. If you take Pascal's wager and then later come to think, you know, I really am quite sure this is false, actually, then you should stop committing. The second point, is the risk of being ensnared in an illusion big enough to give you a reason not to commit to Christianity? Here's an analogy. Suppose your brother is backpacking in Syria because there's some special mountains and ruins there he wants to see. And uh, he disappears. Nobody hears from him for a year. Then you get an email and it purports to be from him. And the email is very short and says that he's been captured by a terrorist group. They want to use him for his knowledge of computer programming and English. And they're not going to let him write anymore. But they will let him receive letters. And if you send letters to this postal address or this email address, you can give him news from home. And this will be a great consolation to him. And he begs you to, to write to him every week. So you think, I'm not sure whether this is from my brother or not. I'm not sure whether this is really my brother speaking. It might be just some sort of spam thing. Let's say you judge that it's 50-50. You think there's a, at least a 50% chance it's from your brother. And then you realize if I start writing every week, I'm going to risk becoming ensnared in an illusion. Maybe the desire to think that I'm helping him cope and the process of addressing him in a letter each week will make me come to believe that he's receiving them and he's hearing this. Mm -hmm. So I might come up with a false belief. Do I therefore have a duty or is it therefore rationally required that I don't write the letters? Far from it. I mean, it seems quite obvious, at least to me. Well, this is obvious. It's not wrong to write the letters. And it also seems like one should write the letters, right, for moral reasons. So we sometimes take on the risk of becoming ensnared in a deception. Why do we do this? Because there are greater good at stake. 
And then here's the last point. What if you don't commit to God? You also are risking becoming ensnared in a deception. I mean, if you don't commit to God and it turns out God exists, you end up with an atheistic belief, you're ensnared in a deception. Or even if you stay agnostic, you're not ensnared in any deception, but you're missing out on the most important truth there is. So the problem is that whichever way you go, you will face non-rational pressures to believe this or that or to not believe this or that. Given that, you're going to face this, these risks either way. The fact that you're facing the risks can't be an argument against going one way rather than the other. Dr. Rota, thanks for talking with us. Thank you, Dale. This week's thinking music has been the track Number Zero by Jesse Spillane. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Help us to get the word out on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and so on. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Every little bit helps. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.